So pretend you work, I'm gonna try this. This may not work. Nope, okay, good. <laughs> pretend you work for a building company and uh, you are one of those people who executes the construction of a property. So your job is to follow the pattern, the blueprints set by the people funding the building and those who have thought through the best way to put together this particular structure on which you work. Now, you, however, you get into this project and you decide that you have figured out what would be better for this building than what is said in the blueprints. All of you know who have ever had a boss know that this approach is not going to succeed. I mean, so the, the architect overseeing this building project will castigate you for deviating from the plans for how to build this property. And you might object, you might object that your modifications achieve two or three practical ends better than the plans, but the architect will tell you that's actually rather beside the point altogether, because that is not what the property's owner wants the building to be. The patron already decided what the building is supposed to be, and your modifications go against that. Your ideas are not wise according to what you are supposed to be doing. The point is uh, that this is nearly the same as the issue that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 23. There, there is a reason that this passage's culmination in verse 23 is, you are Christ's. The context being that the church, God's people, is the temple over which God is patron and he is building. So namely, Christ owns you if you are a Christian. The point was that Christ, your owner, decides what his people, the church, is supposed to be like. We don't get to come up with that and just invent it. Now, let's review. As, as we've studied through 1 Corinthians, we've seen that many people in, in this congregation in Corinth uh, grew their own ideas about what the church was supposed to be which caused divisions among them. Various people in the Corinthian church aligned themselves with different teachers to promote their own prestige through a link to the teacher whom they thought was most prestigious. So Paul reminded them that they have to think in accord with the gospel premises which God revealed by His Spirit, rather than thinking according to merely human wisdom. And the church doesn't have the right to deviate from the blueprints that God, our patron, set for us and, and namely distributed and enforced through the apostle who laid this foundation. And so this passage contains Paul's rebuke, or at least preventative redirection. It's at least that, if not a rebuke, to realign the Corinthians with how God owns the church and has already determined, has said, what it is supposed to be. And there are three imperatives, three commands or instructions that structure the main ideas of these verses, all that redirect the Corinthians towards submission to God's Word as the manifesto for what the church is and what it's supposed to, to look like. So, the main point is that the authority of Scripture entails sanctification in submission. The authority of Scripture entails sanctification in submission. And we're going to think about this in three points, the deception, the direction, and the determination. So, first, the deception. And in this point, we're going to look at the first imperative, the first direction in verse 18. 
let no one deceive himself. So it's short, but it's deep, actually. This first instruction returns to Paul's recurring theme throughout these chapters that the Corinthians had become a little too sure of themselves. They had come to think of themselves as a bit special, specifically as they considered themselves uh, connected to the teachers whom they found to be most special. So let me illustrate this. Okay, so I know it's not obvious, but I go to the gym, and there are some really interesting guys uh, that, that work out there. So <laughs> there's this big wall of mirrors, right? And I am shocked, <laughs> really I am, by how many men are so frequently really surprised and really deeply glad to see themselves. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like they do an exercise and, and they forget that they themselves are there but are delighted to rediscover their own reflection. I, they are really fascinated with themselves and they linger looking over how good they think they look in the mirror. Uh, yeah, I personally find these guys fascination with themselves really humorous, uh, but only because I don't have pastoral care only over what's happening in their hearts. Uh, the point, though, is that Paul actually did have care over people who are essentially just like that, but who were fascinated with their own spiritual inventions and with the possibility of prestige by joining themselves to the big name teacher. So Paul told them not to fool themselves. Just like the gem guys need to see that apparently no one except themselves cares about how they look, so no one except the Corinthians actually thought that the Corinthians were all that great. And I think that this is actually a really poignant point for us as a Reformed church. Because the Reformed tradition is known for deep theological reflection on the Scripture, rightly so, and it's good that we do, and for fervently advocating those truths. And we easily forget that we are meant to be a vehicle for conveying the truth and instead looking down on those who have not developed their theology as deeply as we have. In other words, our temptation is to be impressed with ourselves over our ideas or the teachers we have. It's, so we, like the Corinthians, need to be on our guard that we stay enamored with the message, the message about the depths of Scripture for the sake of maturing Christians, building them up in the faith, rather than because we think we are particularly smart. And I should say, I've probably grown the most in this point, simply by watching Reverend Pearson and the way that he wants to convey the Reformed faith winsomely and be positive about this and encourage me to repent of my own aggressiveness about it. The deception, though, the deception was that the Corinthians had forgotten they need to follow the gospel blueprints for the church that God had delivered through Paul, instead thinking they could invent what the church should be for themselves. That brings us to our second point, the direction. So we saw that Paul's first point was not to be self-deceived, which is a noteworthy warning for us as well. And in this point, we consider Paul's second imperative, his second instruction in verses 18 to 20, where he urged 
them towards the wisdom in God's order of things. So let's read that together, second half of verse 18. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he might, may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Okay, so the, the main direction, the main instruction or imperative here is let him become a fool that he may become wise. That's the, the focused imperative. It's housed within that conditional statement, if anyone th- among you thinks that he is wise in this age. So this then is directed towards that builder who thought that he knew better than the blueprints. As the preceding chapters of this letter have shown, some members of the Corinthian congregation had begun to prefer worldly means of philosophical rhetoric over forthright gospel proclamation. So, so the, if anyone thinks he is wise in this age, harks back to Paul's earlier warning beginning all the way back in chapter 1, verse 17, against those preferences for worldly wisdom. Throughout these chapters, Paul has contrasted worldly wisdom, pure human reason, with divine wisdom, things revealed about the gospel. And it's important to note here, however, that this issue does not seem to be about how we know everything in the world, but about the best ways to see people know salvation. So it's not about how we, you know, do carpentry or do geology, that sort of thing. It's about how to teach the truth and what ways we're supposed to go about explaining the gospel. And Paul pointed out that the worldly wisdom is folly with God. Which means that God has determined, God has already said the way that his church will be built. And he will make sure that his specifications, listen, in outcome and in method, in outcome and in method are successful. While he will discard those bits of supposed ministry that people built with wood, hay, straw, rather than gold, silver, and precious stones. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. So, just like your boss may look over your shoulder at times to make sure you're getting good results, but also getting those results in the right way, so too God has expectations for not only the final product, but also for even the way that we get there. So verses 12 to 13, previously earlier in the chapter, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So the foundation is the apostolic gospel but even with the gospel in place, there is, there is building to be done. God's wisdom dictated that the continual building process must happen, must happen through gospel proclamation. At the day of the Lord, so Christ's great return, our Lord and Master will inspect the results and also the methods we used in building his church and will dispose of all the results that came from methods that he did not instruct us to use. So that gives us a sharp warning against placing too much stock in what we might think are brilliant ideas for how to do church, 
There, there are, so, I mean, yeah, there are some obvious examples, sadly, mainly from America, that I think everyone here agrees we shouldn't do. I don't think anyone here argues that Reverend Pearson and I should use like, props and water guns and video clips, all things which I have seen <laughs> happen to, to illustrate our point. I hope not. <laughs> That sort of thing tends not to land well in Reformed congregations who love the ordinary means of grace. But this passage does point all of us to search ourselves really thoroughly concerning our submission to God's Word. And I think that that might be more specific, more intense than we often think or give it credit for. The authority of Scripture, we treat it this way, but it's not a Protestant moniker. It's not just something we sort of carry about to separate us from other traditions. But it is a matter, a substantial matter, of our sanctification. All the ways you want our congregation to conduct itself have you measured it against God's Word? Now, even in things that seem obviously right, we should all long for the utmost conformity to God's Word. So it's not just I'm sort of generally submissive and generally in conformity to God's Word. We hope that we are, and yet we actually want to be more and more specific. We shouldn't be content in other words. So, here's the point. Like, you may be exactly right. You might be, and that's great. But that does not mean we don't search ourselves first to make sure of that according to God's Word. So, Paul quoted here Job 5.13 and Psalm 94.11 to remind that God's wisdom will undermine humanly devised plans for the church. Interestingly, that's the only place in the New Testament where the book of Job is cited. James 5 mentions Job, but doesn't cite it. This is the only place, which is a topic for another time, but I think it's really fascinating that this is the only place where the book of Job is cited, and maybe later we'll warrant our further reflection. But this, the point, though, here is about our submission to God's Word and seeking after not convenient and obvious adherence to God's Word, but pursuing deep and exacting submission to God's Word in all of its details. Like, we really want that, don't we? It may well bring loads and loads of people to our services if we replaced singing psalms with electric guitars and so-called Christian rock music, whatever that is. But just like Paul urged Greek culture to avoid philosophical rhetoric, so too we shouldn't get this. Like this, this is really important because this is actually what's going on here, okay? So, just like Paul urged them not to adopt Greek philosophical rhetoric, so too we should not appropriate what the culture loves because it's not about being relevant. Those moves are about adopting what the culture loves, and then we try to baptize it to build the church. We shouldn't do that because it's not what God has said. The direction in which Paul enjoined us to go is ever-increasing faithfulness to what God has said. That brings us to our third point, the determination. Okay, so Paul's first imperative instruction was not to deceive ourselves by thinking ourselves more special than we really are, and his second was to become supposedly foolish, according to the world, by listening to God's Word, which is out of accord with worldly wisdom, but is the methods that God promised to use. Paul's last instruction was not to boast in men, in verses 21 to 23. Let's read that together. So, Let no one boast in men, 
for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. So, so the first word there, so, means that this imperative not to boast in men, namely those specific teachers to whom they link themselves, follows after or, or is inferred from the previous imperative to become fools in accord with God's Word. So aligning ourselves with the scriptural methods as verses 18 to 20 should result in not boasting in men. Do you see that? If we, if we align ourselves with the Scripture, then it follows that we don't boast in men. And that's the point. Since we are not actually using methods that men invented. All right, so uh, think about it this way. <laughs> Books about baking and cooking, which are obviously one of my expertises, uh, are much more popular here than where I come from. So the, the fact that bakers and food presenters are sort of mainstream celebrities is really new to me. Uh, if you were to open up one of those baking books, though, and follow the recipe exactly, you would not, or at least you should not, claim that you have crafted a master recipe. You don't boast in yourself, but you, you celebrate the one who actually wrote the recipe. You didn't come up with it. Somebody else did. And that is Paul's point regarding the church. Right? If you follow God's prescri prescribed church methods, you don't boast in the person who simply presented the method. You should boast in the one who revealed the method, who constructed it. If we follow the scripture, that person is God. So if we accept the premise that, that we are simply executing God's plans, his blueprints, then we should realize there's no reason to debate about various leaders, and especially not the benefits we receive from them, because they are simply executing God's plans. God owns everything. And has promised to give you all things. There's not much that falls outside this list if you come to him in Christ. And that raises the, the crucial point of this text, though. Do you know what it is? The promise is outlined in verse 22 and 23 belong to those who are Christ's. And this means if you don't belong to Christ, then life and death, the present, the future, are all things that are unpredictable for you. Your life is not for, secured for this age or for the next. Your death only sends you to meet God as judge who will punish your sins for eternity. And those who belong to Christ, however, are promised all of these things for their good. If we take hold of Christ by faith, we are given eternal life now and forever. It's done. It's definitive. It is accomplished and granted. If we trust in Jesus then even to die is gain because we go to meet our Savior face to face. Taking hold of Christ gives us the right to eternal life, and it takes us right into the divine life because we see here that Christ is God's. We belong to the one who is God's. Christ is God's in that, this is really important, Christ is God's in that He is the Son of God, eternally begotten, 
always participating in the divine essence, but he is also, in the plan of salvation, God's missionary into creation to accomplish salvation as the new representative of God's people. So the determination was God's plan to save his people by his son's work. Christ is the one who came to provide rescue for us all, to be the one to pay for our sins and earn our citizenship in heaven. If God was wise enough to procure our salvation, is he not wise enough to know how to apply salvation in his church? And so let us depend on him for all matters of salvation and for practice as well, hoping that he will work in us by his spirit to bring us into ever-increasing conformity to his word because we know that as we listen to his word, there we find the words of eternal life. Let's pray.